I've covered fast API several times in my previous videos. Today, I'd like to dive in a bit deeper and talk about a few things that you typically won't find in most API tutorials online. I'm going to cover four things that will help you, especially if you want to create a backend that's used in a production setting. This video is sponsored by Pulumi, which is an infrastructure as code solution. I'll talk more about them later in the video. Now, let's dive into Fast API. The example that I'm going to cover today is a simple Fast API backend that has both items and automations. The items are just simple things that you can put in a database. So there are create, read, update, and delete operations on them. Next to that, you have automations that you can run whenever something happens to an item. And I've added a feature here where if you update the item, then some sort of automation is going to be run. And the idea of the automation is also pretty simple. It just runs a piece of Python code. You can, of course, build out these automations more by adding things like triggers, webhooks, different paths depending on certain conditions, etc. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to keep it really simple. Here's a quick overview of the code. So we have a fast API app. It includes some routers. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And one part of the API is that there is a simple GET request that just returns a response that the server is running. So I can start the server with UVCorn, which is a server running tool. It's very useful. And now it's running on localhost on port 8000. When I open the root URL in the browser, then this is what you get. Now, like I said, this has both items and automations. So it's actually pretty easy to read items as well in the browser. So I can simply type, for example, items one, and then it's going to return a JSON structure representing a particular item, in this case, a coffee machine. I'll cover the automation aspect of this API later on in the video. Now, the first thing that I want to show you is that if you have multiple endpoints like items, automations, users, whatever, then it's going to be helpful to split these things up in different routes. And FastAPI has a router mechanism for that. And what this is going to do for you is that this will avoid you having to put all the routes into a single file. And unfortunately, most examples online explaining how to get started with FastAPI don't use routers. They simply put everything in the main file. If you want to build a more complex API application, this is not going to work because your main file is going to be huge. So routers are a really good way of organizing this. So in the main file, you can see that I have here two routers that I've imported. There's the items router and there's the automations router. So these represent each a group of endpoints. And then in order to use them, I simply include them in the app using the include router method. And then it knows these endpoints. And then what I did in the API is that I have here a routers folder where I have my various routers. So there is, for example, the items router, which looks like this. And there's some other things in here that I'm going to cover in a minute as well. So the first thing that you see is that I create a router, an API router. This is a feature of fast API and I give it a prefix. So now any endpoints that are part of this router fall under this prefix. So that means, for example, if I have a get method, router.get and then the item ID, it means you can get this by navigating to root URL slash items slash the ID. So slash item is put in front of every endpoint. And then each route simply contains the code that needs to be run when you call that endpoint. So there's creating an item, there's reading an item, there's uh, reading item automations. So this reads the automations that are associated with an item. We have an update item function and we have a delete item endpoint. So that's how the items router is set up. And if you take a look at the automations router, is that actually pretty similar, except we have a different router with a different prefix. So here it's not slash items, but it's slash automations. And also here we have a create automation, read automation, I was scrolling too far, update automation and delete automation. And actually here's an error, this should be automation. Actually. FastAPI doesn't really care what the names of these functions are, but of course we should call this correctly. And it's all set up in a very similar way to how the items router is set up. That's why this function was called delete item because I just copy pasted everything. So in the items router, for example, create item needs an item create object that contains all the information about the item. I'll show that in a minute. Then getting an item simply needs an item ID, which is in this case an integer. 
and reading item automations also only needs an item ID and then it's going to return a list of automations. Updating an item needs an item update object which contains information about the item that will also show in a minute. And then finally we have deleting the item that simply needs an item ID. And for automations the, the way this setup is exactly the same. So if you create an API that has multiple groups of endpoints like items, automations used, I really recommend that you use routers for this. So that's the first thing that's going to help you organize your code better. The second thing that you're not going to see in most examples online is that directly write the code that should happen if you call the endpoint inside the endpoint function. And if you're creating a more complex API application, that's not really a good way to do things. Uh, for one, the endpoint will then contain everything, which makes it harder to test. A second thing is that you're actually, if you're doing that, you're mixing up two responsibilities. You're mixing up routing which is organizing where which endpoint is and how you should call it, together with the actual behavior of the endpoint code. And next to making things harder to test, that's also going to make things harder to read because then, again, your files that contain all the routes for a particular router are going to get very long. And finally, you know, the problem with writing all that code in your endpoint function, that also means that if, let's say, you ever want to create a command line application, for example, that does the same things as your backend, then you have to copy paste all of that code or you have to do a lot of refactoring work. So if you want to create a more complex API with lots of route groups containing lots of different routes, then you should also separate the routing part of your application from the actual operations. And this is actually what I've done here. So if you look at, let's say, let's take uh, creating an item, which is here. So creating an item, the, the endpoint function is basically almost empty, right? It calls a create database item, which is the actual operation. It passes the item create object, I'll show you what that is in a minute. And it also passes a link to the session, the database session. And then once that's done, then we have a database item object that create database item gives us. And then we transform that into something that fast API can return as a JSON structure. So the operation, which is all in this function, is completely separate from the actual endpoint. And I'm using another thing here that's also a really important part of Fast API, which is dependency injection. So I provide a database session to the endpoint. And that means that I can write tests for this endpoint more easily. So how does this actually work? So in Fast API, if I go to the database section of the code, what you can do is that I have here a basic database setup. So as you can see from the imports, this part is actually independent from the Fast API tool, right? It's, it has some typing imports and it uses SQL Alchemy, which is an ORM to interact with the database. So it's completely separate from the routing aspect of the system, which is really important. So here I just use a simple SQLite database. So it contains a test database. You, you can change this to a SQL connection string if you want to, but then you, you'd have to make sure to not include the credentials in the code that should be in, a, in environment variables. So then using SQL Alchemy, I specify the models that are part of this database setup. So we have a declarative base, which is the core of SQL Alchemy. And then we have two things. We have a database item, so that corresponds to an items table in the database. And an item simply has an ID, a name, and a description. And that's it. And ID is a primary key, and it's also an index. So that's database item, very basic. And then we have an automation. It's also very simple. We have an ID, which is again an integer. So it maps to a table automations. Forgot to mention that. So ID is also a primary key. And then we have the item ID, which is a reference to the item that the automation belongs to. And I simply specify that this is a foreign key. It corresponds to the ID in the items table. And finally, we have code. So this is the code that should be run when we want to run the automation. So that's all there is to it. That's the setup of the database. And then we have the part where we create the connection with the database so that we can use that connection, use the session in Fast API. So first, we need to create a database engine. Then we need a session maker, something that can create sessions for us. And then we create the binding so that the engine knows that these models are actually going to be used in order to interact with the database by SQL Alchemy. And then finally, we have a very simple dependency. 
so this is a function get database that actually gives a database session. And I'm using a generator for this so that we can close the database automatically when we're done. And that's what this try finally block does here. So we yield the database session that we create here. And then finally, whether you get an exception or not doesn't matter, we're going to close the database. And that's good practice to always close database connections when you don't need them because these connections start to pile up and it's going to slow down your database if you're not careful. So then how do we set up this dependency in FastAPI? Well, if you go, for example, to the items router, you see that we import the get database function from here, and then we provide it as a dependency to the function. And then FastAPI will make sure that this function gets called whenever the endpoint is called. And that way we have always a database session. You also see that I passed the database session to the create database item operation. So this function is what's doing the actual work in the database. And of course, that makes sense because you can't work in a database if you don't have a database session. So if you look at the actual implementation of these operations, that's actually what's happening here in items.pi under the DB folder. So we have here a couple of Pydantic models that specify the information we need in order to communicate with this part of the application. So there is an item which has an ID, name, and description. And by the way, these classes are also used by FastAPI to return JSON structures or read JSON data. So item, ID, name, and description, very similar to how the database has been set up. And then we also have item create and item update. So in order to create an item, we need to provide a name and description. Description is optional, it's not necessary. And if we update an item, we can provide either a name or a description. So we can update either one of them. And then we have the actual operation. So create database item, for example, well, it creates a DB item object. So that's an actual ORM model, and then it uses the session to create this database item, and it also returns this as a result. So you can read it and do something with it. Updating a database item also has its own code for performing that operation. So I'm first reading the database item, and I'm actually reusing another operation for that. So that's uh, the one that's here. So this queries the database and then filters it on the item ID returns the first one. If it's not found, it raises a not found error. Then updating the database item, use that to get the database item, it sets the attributes and then commits that in a session. And finally, what this update operation also does is that it runs the automations, which is another part of the system that I mentioned in the beginning. So just include this as simple example, you may want to run automations in different places as well, but this allows you, for example, to execute some custom code whenever an item in a database is updated. And that can be helpful. For example, if you build a web shop, then if an item in the database is updated, then maybe you want to run automatically some code that also updates the item's description on your website. Just a minor design remark, and that's more about where you place the boundaries. So what I've done here is that the input of these functions is a Pydantic base model, it's an item create or an item update or simply an integer, right, item ID. But it returns a database item in a way that doesn't make a lot of sense because you would expect actually that this thing would then also return an item, right? It should return something of this base model because then if you call the function, you don't deal with the database at all. It's completely hidden. So I haven't done that in this particular example because I'm reusing read database item and using that in other functions as well. But probably it would be even better if each of these functions returns actually an item, not a database item. And then I would simply create an internal function to read a database item that I can reuse in these endpoints. That would probably be better because then in the routers, I also wouldn't need to do this conversion step here and knowing about how da database items are being implemented. So in the current implementation, this is not ideal, but this is actually something that's really easy to fix. For example, let's take this function and make a copy of that. And then let's just keep this for internal use. And now this one we can change so that it returns an item. And what we then can simply do is take part of the read item code like this. And then let's change this so that it returns this. And then here, I'm simply going to use the read database item that passes the item ID and the session. 
So now I have this new function that already converts this to an item. And then in my router, I don't need to do this anymore. I can simply do this. Like so. And now this is even simpler. And then of course you can change the other endpoints as well so that it works like this. So for example, creating a database item, I can also simply return the item like so. And then in the router, I can simply do this. And you can do the same thing for the other operations as well. So you can imagine that sometimes it can be hard to determine what the exact boundaries are of what an operation should get as input and what it should return as a result and how it interacts with the database and what routers should or shouldn't know. Because there might also be a disadvantage to actually returning items and not database items. For example, if you combine different operations in your router endpoint, then you may want to pass a database item between the operations for efficiency purposes. If you return an item, you can't do that. You then might need to do multiple database requests to get the information that you actually need. A third thing that you won't see in many examples online is that they don't really talk about deployment all that much. So whenever you start working on a new application, you may not even think about that yourself and then think, you know, I first build the thing and then I'll start thinking about how to actually deploy it. Actually, what I like to do is the other way around. I like to set up the, let's say the scaffolding first before actually doing too much in the code. So typically what I would do if I, let's say I want to create a new backend API that I want to host in the cloud. So what I will do is that I won't build out the complete API locally, but I'll first start with, let's say only the health check endpoints, just an empty get request, and then set up the whole scaffolding, including the whole deployment, um, CI CD pipeline uh, settings that you need in the cloud, everything to actually run this API and deploy it to the cloud whenever you push a new version to the main branch. And the reason why I do it that way, why I don't build out the complete API and then think about deployment is that I want to make sure that all the pieces fit together. And in my experience, this part, setting up the scaffolding and deployment and everything is often the most tricky to get right because you will have to create things like Docker files with the various imports and dependencies. And there's many things that can go wrong. There's also many things that can go wrong with setting secrets up correctly so that you have access to the right credentials, enabling APIs in your cloud provider so that you can actually host your API in the way that you want to in the cloud. So there's lots of things that can go wrong lots of things that you need to set up and it can be very frustrating if you wait with that until the last minute because it's possible that due to some dependency that you're using that actually blocks being able to deploy it properly to the cloud so i find it's important to set this up as soon as possible and basically deal with the potential problems as soon as possible so that afterwards once it's set up then it's pretty easy to build out the api and add more features to it for deployment you can use different tools one that i'd like to use is pulumi they're also the sponsor of this video pulumi is what's called an infrastructure as code tool and that means you can define what your cloud infrastructure looks like and handle provisioning those resources by actually writing code using your favorite programming language. So you can use Python, for example, to define what your infrastructure looks like. And I find that really helpful. In this particular API, what I've done is I've created a Docker file. So that's what I see here. So it's built on Python 3.11. And actually the Docker file is pretty basic. So I simply install the dependencies. I copy the scripts to the folder and then I simply start the server just like I would do on my local machine. But then I have a main file, which is a Python file that actually specifies how to create the resources in the cloud. And being able to do this in Python, I find this very helpful because it simplifies the workflow a lot in my opinion. So there's a couple of helper functions like creating a registry where we're going to host the Docker image that we're going to build. Then we have a function for building an image. So this all relies on Pulumi's libraries. This uses Pulumi Docker, for example, so it creates an image. And I'm also passing some build arguments because I'm running this on a Mac, which has Apple Silicon. So I need to make sure that it builds for Linux AMD 64 processors, otherwise it won't work. And then I'm hosting this application in the cloud using Google's Cloud Run service. So here I'm using the Pulumi package for Google Cloud. Then I have a function that sets the right access policy so that it's actually publicly available. And finally, 
have a main file where I call these functions and deploy the actual application. So I create a registry, then I'm going to get the information about the registry, build an image, create the Cloud Run service, create the access policy, and then I export the important information like what is the URL of the Cloud Run service, for example, or what was the image name that was generated. So I can find it back easily. And then what's really nice with Pulumi is that it's really easy to then deploy your application to the cloud. So you simply write Pulumi up and then it will set up all of these things in the cloud for you. What's nice about an infrastructure as code solution is that you can do things with it that aren't possible if you define your infrastructure statically. And this is actually how I built the automations part of this example. So here you see what the code looks like when I want to run an actual automation from code in the cloud. And uh, what I'm doing is that on the fly, whenever I want to run a piece of code, I create a sandbox environment, a serverless function in the cloud that actually runs that code. And then right after that, I immediately destroy the function again. So this allows me to run code in a isolated environment and then destroy that environment immediately. So it doesn't affect other parts of my backend. If you were to run automation code directly in your backend, it might be dangerous because if that code breaks your backend server, then well, you have a problem. So if you do it in an isolated environment, that's much better. And that's actually what I'm doing here. So the first step is again, some scaffolding work, preparing a virtual environment. So as you can see, I'm directly calling Python here to create a VM. And then I install the requirements. And then I have the function that runs all the automations. So I get the code from the automation and then I'm using Pulumi's automation framework to actually on the fly create a cloud resource. So that's what's happening here. So I prepare the virtual environment by calling that function. Then I create a new stack. So Pulumi works with different stacks like a development stack or production stack. In this case, I create a development stack and then I'm updating the stack. So this is going to create the resources in the cloud for me and then what I get as a result from doing that is a function URL. So I create a cloud function and this gives me a URL. And then next step is that I actually invoke the function passing the code of the automation. And then as a final step, I destroy the stack again. And how I set this up is that next to the API, I have a simple code runner setup, which is basically another service that has a very simple main file that basically has a run code function that gets the actual code to run from JSON, it captures whatever we write to the standard out or standard error, and then it returns that as a result. And this is simply another infrastructure as code setup that deploys a cloud function using Pulumi. And then when you actually update an item and run the automations, you see that it actually runs the code part of the automations in the cloud function and returns that as a result. So infrastructure as code allows you to do these kind of things dynamically and it opens up a lot of possibilities. If you want to try out Pulumi, it's free. You can simply go to pulumi.com. The link is also in the description of this video. A final important thing to think about is that when you deploy your API, you also need to make sure that people can't abuse it. There's several things you can do. One is that you can create an authentication flow using OAuth and bearer tokens and API keys so that you know who it is. You can restrict access using scopes. That's all part of the OAuth standard. And that's one way to make sure that your users don't have access to things that they shouldn't have access to. So whenever you're creating a more complicated production level API, you should definitely also add some sort of authentication flow. And authentication flows are a whole other topic. If you'd like me to do a video about that, let me know in the comments. So adding authentication is important, but that's not the only thing you should do because A, that doesn't help if you're developing a public API or if your API has public endpoints. And B, it also doesn't preclude users from sending out way too many requests in a row. And if you want to deal with that, the best thing to do is to add a rate limiter to your backend API so that you can restrict the number of times users or anybody can call your endpoints. So how does a rate limiter typically work? Well, it's going to look at things like the ID of your machine, the IP address, things like that to make sure you're from not from a single machine sending thousands of requests per second. So FastAPI doesn't have direct built-in support for rate limiting, but there are packages that integrate really well with FastAPI. And one of them is SlowAPI, and that's actually the rate limiter that I'm using here. So setting up slow API is really simple. You just need to add an exception handler for rate limit exceeded. That's an error type from slow API. And then you need to pass it the handler that handles that particular error. And then what you can do in your routers or in your simple endpoints is that you can add limiters. So here's how that's set up. So slow API has a limiter class 
and we can indicate how we want to determine how the limiter is going to detect that a request comes from a different user. And I'm using the get remote address function for that, that looks at the remote address of the machine that's doing the API call. So that creates the limiter. And then in my router, I import this limiter, and then I'm using it as a decorate to define how often we can request that. And here we put a limit of one per second. And since the limiter needs to access the actual request and order to extract the information, you need to also make sure to pass it as an argument to your endpoint function. Otherwise, this doesn't work. So this way, we've now defined a limiter for this particular endpoint. And then you can do this for every endpoint and you can specify different types of limits. So for example, if you want creating an item to be one request per second, but reading an item, you may want to do that uh, more. So you want to put the limits maybe a bit higher at 10 per second. It's really easy to change this in the limiter specification. There's one minor caveat to take into account. It's that you need to specify these decorators in the right order. So limiter needs to be below the router.get decorator, otherwise this won't work correctly. So these are just some of the things you need to think about when you create a production API. So first, split your endpoints into separate routers so that the code becomes more manageable. Also move operations out of the endpoint functions so that you can more easily test them and more easily reuse them in other types of applications, such as a command line interface. The third point is that you need to think about deployment of your application, set up the scaffolding first, because that's gonna lead to most of the issues, gonna take up most of the time, so do that as the first step. And the fourth one is that you need some way to control access. So whether that's an authentication flow or using a limiter or both, that's really important to think about in order to make your APIs scalable and safe. Now, fifth thing that I didn't talk about at all in this video is that you need to actually write software test. When you write your test for your fast API backend, there are a couple of things you can do to make your life a lot easier. If you want to learn about that, watch this video next where I dive into the details. Thanks for watching and see you soon.